Welcome back. We're going on to chapter 11, the emergence of the treasure tower uh, chapter from the orally transmitted teachings. Uh, there are multiple things that I have to go over before we get into it from the, from the, um, uh, uh, from the, before we get into the uh, OTT, I have to read a lot of things from the, from the dictionary. And again, just like last time we were together, uh, it's easier for me and less time consuming if I just go ahead and line them up and then there's 20 things I'm gonna read from the dictionary here right now, okay? So he's gonna mention, and, and these are all things as we read his, his, his input on, this, on, the, on the pieces of that uh, sutra uh, that he's commenting on. You know, always remember, he mentions all of these, a lot of the things I'm going to talk about. Like, for instance, the first one that is, you know, the first in this list is five, the five practices. Okay, do you know what the five practices are? We just, he just, just revealed them in, in uh, chapter 10. Okay, it's real easy. This is real easy stuff, but then it's got technical names, and I just have to go over the technical names, okay? Mm -hmm. Because he's going to mention the technical name. And the whole point of his teaching this, all right, is to qualify that everything he's saying is legit, okay? About Nam Yoho Rengekyo being able to attain Buddhahood in your present form, okay? He qualifies where it says that in the sutra what it means when it says that in the sutra, what the interpretations of the sages that followed Shakyamuni qualified it to be, where it's evolved to now, and where it stands as it relates to his own teaching, okay? So, the five practices. Uh, five kinds of practice described in the teacher of the law, the 10th chapter we just read, mm -hmm. right? 10th chapter of Lotus Sutra, they are to embrace, read, recite, expound and transcribe the Lotus Sutra. We do that. I do that. Anybody can do that. Those are part of the requirements, okay? Five kinds of practice described in the teacher of the law chapter of the Lotus Sutra. They are to embrace. You all embrace. Right. We all read. Right. We all recite. Yes. We all should be doing shakabuku, that is to expound. Okay, we should be sharing with others. That is to expound. Mm -hmm. And as far as trans transcription, uh, the manner in which we do that now is to show people somehow a, a way to get to the internet, how to get to the doctrinal study. That's what transcription is. Transcription otherwise would have been, you would have been writing out the Lotus Sutra or whatever sutra or whatever teaching right. so that there would be a written form for the, to be passed on. Now in the digital age, you just got to point them in the right direction for what's already been published. Right. Mm. Okay, that's still transcribing in right. the latter day. Right. We don't. <laughs> have you ever seen handwriting? How? When was the last time you wrote? Well, you don't do <laughs> that. You do something. <laughs> we have handwriting, written script, script, right, and right. printing. If you've printed long enough or have it written. Mm -hmm. I mean, I don't know how your signature looks like now, but mine mm -hmm. doesn't look anything like it did when I started signing my name. That's what I'm trying to say, okay. Mm -hmm. So transcription doesn't have to be literally done with your fingers. Right. Okay? Okay, the teacher of the law chapter says that one who embraces, reads, recites, expounds, and transcribes even a single verse. So it's not like, you know, this is your new, new full-time job. Even a single verse, he's trying, he's trying to qualify the merit contained with even, even a single word of the Lotus Sutra compared to other teachings. The teacher of the law chapter says that one who embraces, reads, recites, expounds, and transcribes even a single verse of the sutra will attain Buddhahood without fail. In this chapter, Shakyamuni says that to, to the Bodhisattva Medicine King, you should understand that such persons who carry out the five practices, all of us, have already offered almost 100,000 million Buddhas and in the place of the Buddhas have fulfilled, have fulfilled their great vow. And because, in other words, okay, they fulfilled their great vow. So what is that? To attain Buddhahood, right? Yeah. Save, all, save, save all of this. Uh, because of their, um, hang on, uh, and because they take pity, in other words, they've already fulfilled their great vow. Mm. 
they are functioning as bodhisattvas, but it's not because they haven't already attained Buddhahood. Mm -hmm. Okay? Yeah. They're functioning as bodhisattvas because they're dealing with people in the nine realm, worlds. Right. right. Okay? Okay. And, and that who have fulfilled their great vow, and because they take pity on living beings, they have been born in this human world. Mm -hmm. So once again, what we always heard, we decided where we're born, mm -hmm. we make those decisions through the causal circumstance we create for kar as our karma, as mm -hmm. bodhisattvas, as Buddhas. Mm -hmm. right, this is qualifying, yes, that we made the causes. We're here only because we are here to teach the law, really is what this is saying. If uh, Madison King, if someone should ask what living beings will be able to attain Buddhahood in a latter day existence, in a latter day existence, so that is in the latter age of Mapo, okay, a latter day existence, 10,000 years and beyond, then you should know, uh, then you should show him all these people in the latter day existence are certain to attain Buddhahood. Various categories of the five practices are set forth in Buddhism in different schools and so forth. Continuing, that's five practices. Then the three types of learning. Also three disciplines. Three disciplines that Buddhist practitioners seek to master. Precepts, meditation, and wisdom. Does that sound familiar to you? Where else do we hear precepts, meditation, and wisdom being actualized uh, as a representative uh, reality? Anybody know? Okay, precepts is Shila or Shila. Meditation is Jaina, uh, and wisdom is Prajna. Okay, precepts, meditation, and wisdom, three great secret laws. Mm -hmm. Okay, that's what he's already qualified that the Gohonzon does everything necessary. Yeah. for you to be covered on these three types of learning. You do those three types of learning just by chanting Daimoku and practicing the Daishonin's teaching. Buddhism as a whole, though, says you got to master this before you can be a Buddha. So the Daishonin is constantly going through and saying, okay, all these things that are prerequisites, mm -hmm. you accomplish this way, you accomplish this way, you accomplish this way. You should never be worried whether or not you're really attaining the real Buddhahood that's being discussed in the sutras, because you are doing all these little uh, 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 Hinayana kind of things mm -hmm. through your Mahayana practice. Okay, I'll get to that in a second. Uh, do understand, that's all this is saying. Three types of learning, we already do them, all right? Mm -hmm. Also, three disciplines, the three, discipline, uh, three disciplines that Buddhist practitioners seek to master, precepts, meditation, and wisdom. These three are said to encompass all aspects of Buddhist doctrine and practice. So if you're doing those three, you got everything covered, okay? There's nothing escaping you. Precepts are rules or disciplines intended to prevent error and put an end to evil in thought, word, and deed. Most often, their precepts are being done by Hinayana, right? right. Not Mahayana, okay? Yeah. But there are precepts for Mahayana, like doing Gongyo, like chanting Daimoku, to the mm -hmm. those are still precepts, okay? Mm -hmm. uh, intended to prevent error and put an evil in thought, word, and deed. Meditation is a practice designed to focus one's mind, to focus one's mind, and cause it to become tranquil. nam myo ho renge nam myo ho renge to the Gohonzon. Okay, wisdom rids one of illusions, enables one to realize the truth. Uh, see also meditation, prajne, and precepts, which you're going to hear. Because again, that's what this all boils down to. This is not those three, though. This is a different, another three. Three rules of preaching. We just studied this from chapter 10. What are the three rules of preaching? If we're going to preach the truth, if we're going to preach the law, the Lotus Sutra, what do we do? What kind of attitude should we have? How do we go about it? The robe, the seat, and the room. Act like a Buddha, be a Buddha. That's what this is basically saying. You are a Buddha. 
-hmm. Okay? When you're preaching like that, you're already, you've already, how, how could you preach the law without already being a Buddha? Uh -huh. mm. Okay? You, don't, you can't. Okay? You can try, but you can't. Not in the what, what we're talking about here. All right? Three rules of preaching. This is really, again, this pertains to teachers of the law. Now, if you haven't manifest that state or that mission or that sense of clarity of, of requirement, you're not going to pick up on this at all. Okay, mm -hmm. you're going to read right through the chapter and you're going to read all about the robe and the seed in the room and you're not going to okay. perceive it yeah. as the it's expressing a means to enlightenment to you. All right. Okay, let me see it. Read what it says. Also three, rule, uh, also, three rules of the robe, seat, and room. The three rules of preaching uh, represented by the robe, seat, and, the, and room of the thus come one, or Buddha. Three essentials for propagating the Lotus Sutra after Shakyamuni Buddha's death mentioned in the Teacher of the Law, 10th chapter of the, Lot of the Lotus Sutra, which we just read. The chapter says that one who desires to teach the Lotus Sutra after the Buddha's death should Enter the thus come one's room, put on the thus come one's robe, and sit in the thus come one's seat. It then explains that the room of the thus come one means uh, great compassion for all living beings. The robe of the thus come one means a gentle and forbearing heart. And the seat of the thus come one, uh, pardon me, and the seat of the thus come one means the realization that all phenomena are uh, without substance or empty. In effect, this means in propagating the Lotus Sutra, one should have a mind of great compassion, abide in the truth of the non-substantiality of all phenomena, and bear all hardships with patience. All right? So don't forget the truth of the non-substantiality of all phenomena. Now, we went through that before we read chapter 10 to make sure you understood it. We're going to do it again because this is chapter 11 is also a lot about non-substantiality, okay? Mm -hmm. So, all right, the next one. Was this it here, down here? No. Okay, I'm going, to go, I'm going to go into three kinds of wisdom now before I get out of the threes. Hang on. Yeah, because the next one after this is... No, that's 12 wing. Okay. Three kinds of wisdom. Three kinds of wisdom explaining the treatise on the great perfection of wisdom. Okay? What is that? Who is that? I've said it so many times, you should know. You should be able to tell me. Who's given, who's, who's attributed? They don't know for sure that he was the, 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 the author of this. It's Nagar Juna. Nagar Juna. Okay, wrote the, uh, the treatise on the great perfection of wisdom. They are as follows. The one, the wisdom to understand the universal aspect of phenomena. This is the wisdom of persons of the two vehicles, voice hearers and cause awakened ones who understand the truth of non-substantiality or the non-substantial nature of existence, which I will reinforce when I read non-substantiality. Again, that is the basis of everything. When we talk about the truth of the middle way, we start out with uh, non-substantiality, right? Non-substantiality, then we go to temporary existence, then we go, oh, it's something in the middle, mm -hmm. okay? so. That first one was that truth of non-substantiality, that you don't have a personality that stays intact, that you're a temporary gathering of the five components. Mm -hmm. You understand that whole, what that's all about, right? Mm -hmm. when, you, when, when you die, you don't really die, but you do dissipate into uh, an infusion, if you will, into the environment, mm -hmm. okay? All right, so uh, there, the wisdom to understand the universal aspect of, he's gonna call it air. He's going to say non-substantiality is similar to air. Mm -hmm. Yeah, air, because I can't see it. I can put my fingers right through it, but it's there at all times, okay? So, the wisdom to understand the universal aspect of phenomena. That's from, the air thing is from ch chapter 11. This is the wisdom of persons of the two vehicles, voice hearers, cause awakened ones, who understand the truth of non-substantiality or the non-substantial nature of existence. Two, the wisdom to understand the various paths to enlightenment, bodhisattvas, 
possess this wisdom, which enables them to understand the individual aspects of existence or the truth of temporary existence, as well as the various paths to enlightenment, so that they may save others accordingly. Now, do you understand? This isn't a wisdom that you get so that you know everything for yourself or for your own self-benefit. This is a wisdom that allows you to see the different ways you could encourage someone toward embracing the law and helping them attain the goal of attaining Buddhahood. Mm. All right. So it's a different kind of wisdom. That's Buddha wisdom. Buddha wisdom doesn't care about your personal shit. Mm. Okay. Buddha wisdom is always about the Dharma realm. Always. Because your personal shit is temporary. Don't get too attached to it. It isn't going to be there again, just like it is now. Okay. So understand that part of it. That's, that's really enlightenment is understanding this truth. That's why I'm going to get into all this dictionary stuff because your district chief won't te teach it to you this way. Okay. Uh, or quite with this clarity. The wisdom, pardon me, or th pardon, uh, uh, so that they may save others accordingly. Three, the wisdom to understand both the universal aspect and individual aspects of phenomena. This is the Buddha wisdom, which perceives both the universal aspect and individual aspects of phenomena or the middle way, non-substantiality, temporary existence, the middle way, okay? That's what that was just talking about. Mm -hmm. This is the Buddha wisdom, which perceives both the universal aspect and individual aspects of all phenomena, or the middle way, as well as the various paths to enlightenment. So you're doing all the things that the voice hearers, cause awakened ones, and bodhisattvas can do. If you can do all three of them, what are you? Buddha. Buddha. Because they're all just three aspects of Buddhahood, mm. right? Okay, so, uh, as well as various paths to enlightenment. In Tantai's teaching, one can obtain the three kinds of wisdom simultaneously through meditation aimed at perceiving the unification of the three truths in a single mind. That's understanding non-substantiality, temporary existence, the truth in the middle of the way, understanding it. Understanding it is the basis of all things, yeah. all right? Uh, a, as a Buddha would understand it, okay? In a single mind, in a single, the mind king. The mind king exists, it's not your brain. It's a karmic entity, okay? Hence, it is called the three kinds of wisdom in a single mind, okay? You get it, mm -hmm. all right? Specifically, through perception of the truth of non-substantiality, one obtains the wisdom of the two vehicles. Cause, voice hears and cause awaken ones, right? Yep. Through the perception of the truth of temporary existence, one acquires the wisdom of bodhisattvas. And through perception of the truth of the middle way, one gains the Buddha wisdom. All right? Um, next. The 12 linked chain of causation. Do you guys all know what that is? Why don't you hear that very often? Disgust. If I'm gonna bring it up now. He's, he's gonna mention it, so I have to mention it. And you'll, know, you'll never know where it came from. 12 linked chain of causation. All has to do with Hinayana. Okay, it's not all, all the things that make you to be miserable if you're in, an, in an existence, okay? This is all leading to getting blown out, which is not Mahayana Buddhism, all right? Mm -hmm. But it's the, it preceded Mahayana Buddhism, okay? And it's in the teaching as such, all right? So the 12 link change of causation, Shakyamuni explained it. He says, one thing leads to another, that leads to another thing, that leads to another thing, okay? So this is what he's gonna say. Also, 12 nidanas, or 12 link chain of dependent origination, okay? Causation, dependent origination is the same thing, right? This is what makes us be around each other. An early doctrine of Buddhism, an early doctrine of Buddhism, uh, Hinayana Buddhism, 
actually is what it is, showing the causal relationship between ignorance and suffering. The Sanskrit word nidana means the cause or cause of existence. Shakyamuni is said to have taught the 12 link chain of causation in answer to the question of why people have to experience the sufferings of aging and death. Each link in the chain is a cause that leads to the next link. The first link in the chain is ignorance. And I won't say the Sanskrit after each one because it's not necessary. The first one is ignorance, which gives rise to the second one, action, also volition or karmic action, mm -hmm. to, which leads to the third one, action causes consciousness, okay? Or function, or the function to discern, mm -hmm. all right? Because this is the temporary gathering of five components. This is all form, fact, you know, perception, conception, volition, mind. Mm -hmm. All right, that's what this is breaking down and, and, and functionalizing, okay, from theoretical components to uh, life existence experiences. Okay, so three, action causes consciousness or the function to discern. Consciousness causes name and form or spiritual and the material of, uh, objects of discernment. Rio, Tom, Mei Ling, okay. Uh, consciousness causes name and form or spiritual materials of, oh, pardon me, that's four. Five, name and form cause the six sense organs. Six, the six sense organs cause contact. Contact causes sensation. Nine, sensation causes desire. Desire, ten, uh, pardon me, Eight, sensation causes desire. Nine, desire causes attachment. Mm. 10, attachment causes existence. And 11, existence causes birth. And 12, causes, uh, and 12 birth causes age and aging and death. The 12 link chain of causation is seen in two ways. The way of transmigration and the way of emancipation, all right? From the viewpoint of the way of transmigration, ignorance gives rise to action, action causes consciousness, etc. Finally, birth causes aging and death as explained above. Thus, one is caught in the cycle of delusions and suffering. None of this has to do with attaining Buddhahood. All right? All of this is an explanation of people being common mortals and staying common mortals. Mm -hmm. On the other hand, from the viewpoint of the way of emancipation, we should tell you right away when they use the word emancipation, we're not talking about Hinayana. If ignorance is wiped out, so is action. So this is what it's saying. I'll, I'll just read it, but then, uh, then I'll describe what it's saying. Okay. From the viewpoint of the way of transmigration, ignorance gives rise to action. Action causes consciousness, etc. Finally, birth causes aging and death as explained above. Thus, one is caught in, caught in the cycle of delusion and suffering. On the other hand, from the viewpoint of the way of emancipation, if ignorance is wiped out, now, comma, that, that's the whole thing. If ignorance is wiped out, then all this other shit I'm going to talk about happens. But what is, if ignorance, if ignorance is wiped out, mm -hmm. what is that? If it's, if we've talked about emancipation, we're viewing it, the 12 link chain of causation, from the perception of, from the perspective of emancipation, what's emancipation? Freedom from being encumbered. That's emancipation. To become emancipated is to become free. Mm -hmm. Okay, what would that then mean? What would, it, what would be freedom? Buddhahood. There's only one thing that's freedom. Okay, Buddhahood. We get to decide when we come back. We get to decide how we're going to manifest. Okay, we're free from karmic impediment. We're nam yoho rengekyo, thus come once. And he's going to say that clearly in this chapter. This is what I love about it. He's going to start making some bold declarations about who we are. All right, so let me just again. Okay, okay. okay. Thus, one is caught in, on the other hand, from the viewpoint of the way of emancipation, if ignorance is wiped out, if one uh, 
here's the name and the words of the truth. That's ignorance being wiped out, right? Mm -hmm. Once you hear the name and the words of the truth, you will always continue to hear the name and the words of truth until you embrace it at the point of Buddhahood, right? right. right. What is the name and the words of the truth in the latter day? Nam myoho rengekyo, right. Okay, so what he's really saying here now is, on the other hand, from the viewpoint of the way of emancipation, the way of emancipation is the way of nam myoho rengekyo, and you're already a Buddha and everyone else is as well, okay? If ignorance, if your lack of ability to perceive that truth is wiped out, so is action of slander. Okay, if action is wiped out, so is consciousness of delusion. Finally, if birth is wiped out, so are aging and suffering. You, became, you become truly immortal as it relates to your karma. In short, if one eliminates ignorance, which is the source of suffering, one becomes free from the cycle of delusion and suffering or attains nirvana. Okay, what's or attains nirvana? If I was a Hinayana and, it's, and this promise was, or attains nirvana, what would it be? It would be to be blown out. I would no longer, re, I would no longer reincarnate, mm. okay? But we're Mahayana, okay? So from, in short, if one eliminates ignorance, then, which is the, suf, a, a cause, uh, the source of suffering, one becomes free from the cycle of delusion and suffering or attains nirvana. If ignorance is wiped out, one attains nirvana. If we encounter the name and the words of the truth, we become Buddhas in our present form. The great commentary on, are you guys following what I'm saying? Okay. The great commentary on the Abhidharma, a text uh, of the Sarvesta Vita Sutra uh, school, pardon me, views the 12 link chain of causation as operating over the three existences of life, meaning one's past, present, and future. One, ignorance and two action are together interpreted as the causes created in a past life three consciousness through seven sensation as the effects manifest in the present life eight desire through existence ten as the causes created in the present life and eleven birth and twelve aging and death as the effects manifest in the next life aging and death in this life that's the only, one of the only reasons I want to get all the way to the end. Aging and death in this life are thus. So this is a conclusion of this perspective coming from the, uh, the, uh, the Soka Gakkai Dictionary. Aging and death in this life are thus the results of causes formed in previous life. Not in this life. Mm -hmm. That's why you never know when it's coming. Okay. Next, treasure tower. Okay. We talked last week about, we, we were talking about the treasure tower is us. Right? Mm -hmm. Right. Okay, treasure tower. A treasure, a tower or stupa adorned with treasures or jewels. Several of them, different, tre different treasure towers are mentioned in different sutras. Any of a variety of jeweled, any of a variety of jeweled stupas depicted in Buddhist scriptures. So there's more than one treasure tower in terms of the scriptures. Mm -hmm. The best known is the treasure tower of many treasures Buddha that appears in the treasure tower 11th chapter of the Lotus Sutra, which we're gonna discuss when I start reading. Mm -hmm. According to the sutra, the massive tower emerges from below the earth and measures 250 yojanas wide and 500 yojanas high. Now, a yojana is a, is a calculable uh, distance. Mm -hmm. And this distance that I just said, 500 by 250 by 500, mm -hmm. is a third of the size of the earth. Mm -hmm. Okay, so this is a very mm -hmm. massive structure. Okay, it's, it's more massive than can be reality. Okay, all right. <clears throat> According to the sutra, the massive tower emerges from below the earth and measures yada, yada, yada. What also emerges from below the earth? Nice. The bodhisattvas of the earth. They emerge from the same place the treasure tower has been all this time. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So it's Do you get it? Well, this is, again, this is the way I perceive it. 
The bottom line is that we have been Buddhas for lifetimes on top of lifetimes already, okay? We didn't just become the way we are right now because we decided to this time. We had to make causes to get to where we are right now, okay? So the bottom line is yes, the teach the Buddhism of sowing is buried in the depths of the lifespan chapter of the Lotus Sutra. Mm -hmm. When it's the latter age, we switch the teacher and the teaching, but the truth is re exactly the same. Mm -hmm. And that's all that Aishonin is doing in all this, is mashing up the truth that's already been qualified as truth by Tian Tai, by, uh, uh, you know, spoken by uh, uh, Shakyamuni, and then interpreted and qualified and reinforced as, yeah, based on this and this and this by all these other scholars, right? Okay, so. The best known tower is the treasure tower of many treasures Buddha that appears in the treasure tower 11th chapter of the Lotus Sutra. According to this sutra, this is very, very big. It is adorned with seven kinds of treasures, gold, silver, lapis lazuli, seashell, agate, pearl, and carnelian. And seated inside the tower is many treasures Buddha. Okay, now, Last chapter, the Daishonin qualified that we are all, that many treasures is a name for all of us because we're many Buddhists, mm -hmm. right? Yeah. We're all the treasure of Buddhahood, all right? Uh, Tentai gives two reasons for the appearance of the treasure tower in the Lotus Sutra. One, to substantiate the teaching of replacing the three vehicles with the one vehicle expounded in the theoretical teaching first half of the Lotus Sutra. And two, to prepare for Shakyamuni's revelation in the lifespan 16th chapter of the essential teaching, the sutra's latter half of his original attainment of enlightenment, numberless major world system dust particle kalpas in the past. Nietzsche viewed the treasure tower as an allegory for human life in its enlightened state through, uh, uh, in its enlightened state achieved through chanting Nam Myoho Renge Kyo. So Nichiren viewed the treasure tower for our lives as Nam Myoho Renge Kyo, thus come once, okay? In a letter Nichiren wrote in 1272, known as On the Treasure Tower, he says, in the latter day of the law, no treasure tower exists other than the figures of the men and women who embrace the Lotus Sutra. So that's why I always talk about the scroll versus the real Gohonzon inside you. It follows, therefore, that what, whether eminent or humble, high or low, those who chant Nam Myoho Renge Kyo are themselves the treasure tower and likewise are themselves the thus come one many treasures. No treasure tower exists other than Myoho Renge Kyo, Nam Myoho Renge Kyo. The Daimoku of the Lotus Sutra is the treasure tower. Every time he mentions sutras, he qualifies. I'm, now it's the latter age I'm talking about, Nam Myoho Renge Kyo, not the Lotus Sutra when he says sutra. Uh, the Daimoku Lotus Sutra is the treasure tower, and the treasure tower is Nam Myoho Renge Kyo. That says it there. The Daimoku <laughs> of the Lotus Sutra is the treasure tower, and the treasure tower is Nam Myoho Renge Kyo. The Daimoku is Nam Myoho Renge Kyo. In the same letter, he also refers to the Gohonzon, the object of devotion in his teaching, as the treasure tower. Okay? Now, have you ever heard? Okay, now he's qualified that we're the treasure tower. But in reality, until this, the treasure tower has been Gohonzon, as he's been passing it out to a Butsubo, to whoever. Okay, all of, the, all of the mentions of the treasure tower to his teaching. I will bestow upon you the treasure tower. It's the, it's the Gohonzon. Okay, so what I'm trying to qualify is that in my mind, wouldn't it make sense? Okay, let me, let me, it'll, I'll have to read it from the, go from the OTT for it to make sense. Okay, so you got that, right? The, uh, uh, Last sentence, no treasure tower exists other than Myoho Renge Kyo. The Daimoku Lotus Sutra is the treasure tower. The treasure tower is Nam Myoho Renge Kyo, 299, volume one. 
of uh, writings of Nietzsche and Dyson. In the same letter, he also refers to the Gohonzon, the object of devotion, in his teaching as the treasure tower, because the Gohonzon and your life are inseparable. Yes. Right? So if one is the treasure tower, the other one has to be the treasure tower as well. Mm. Yes. Okay. Emergence of the treasure tower chapter is the last thing I'll read uh, from the Gosho. Like I said, these got kind of mixed up. Uh, this is non-substantiality, going back into non-substantiality, or the air. Again, this is a fundamental Buddhist concept translated as emptiness, void, latency, or relativity. The Sanskrit shunya or shunyeta means emptiness. Shunya mean, also means empty or empty of. It is the concept that things and phenomena have no fixed or independent nature or existence of their own. That's all it is. Not substantiality means that nothing stays the same. And modern science would tell us that's the truth. Okay? Just a, a simple human brain would tell us all the plants die, all the people die, all the animals die, now we know all the planets die, all the environments die, okay? So, non-substantiality, however, being that kind of a, of a perception of that nothing sustains itself forever, is neither negative, that's not a negative, nor is it world negating, because that's really karma. That's really karma but teaches the importance of perceiving the true nature of phenomena. You can't hang on to things that are temporary as though they're permanent. You'll only disappoint yourself, okay? Uh, <clears throat> but teaches the importance of perceiving the true nature of phenomena, which are on the surface transient. The wisdom sutras, what I am right now is transient. What I am inside is eternal. Do you understand yes. the point that's being made? Yes. Okay, same thing for everything out there that I just now said is going to die. It doesn't really die. It's none of that is transient. None of that is transient, okay? There is no transience, okay? In reality, just where it appears to be in transient, okay? Because it reappears, it proves, all right? Okay, this concept, pardon me, let me go back. Non-substantiality is neither negative nor world negating, but teaches the importance of perceiving the true nature of phenomena, which is, are on the surface transient. The wisdom sutras developed in the uh, developed the Mahayana concept of non-substantiality, and Nagarjuna systemized it based on them. The concept originated in connection to those of dependent origination and of uh, non and the non-existence of self nature that we're not permanently who we who we are right now dependent origination means that phenomena arise only by virtue of their relationship with other phenomena as we discussed last time we were together this we did read non substantiality because we talked about the fact that we only appear because of one another and because there's an environment that draws us to it. <clears throat> we have, they have no distinct nature or existence of their own that stays permanent, that never changes. Non-existence or self-nature means that there is no independent entity that exists alone apart from other phenomena because we all are part of the same phenomena, the original state called nam myoho renge -kyo. The common message is that the true nature of all phenomena is non-substantiality and that it cannot be defined in terms of concepts of existence and non-existence. Nagarjuna explained it as the middle way, a perspective that regards the categories of existence and non-existence as extremes and aims to transcend them. The practical purpose behind the teaching of non-substantiality lies in eliminating attachments to transient phenomena and to the ego or the perception of self as independent and a fixed identity. You have no fixed identity. All right, next, specks of dirt on a fingernail. I know this is meaningless, but I wanted to make sure you understand that. 
You hear it all the time in a lot of different go shows. He's talking about the difficulty of actually pulling this off and the challenge that's contained therein. The num it's a specks of dirt, of dirt on a fingernail. The number of particles of dirt that can be placed or balanced on a fingernail, an expression used in Buddhist texts to represent ex extreme scarcity or rarity, mm -hmm. as Buddhahood is described. Because you're going to have to go through all of the difficulty of the three obstacles and the four devils to finally finish that one off. And a lot of people don't make it through that, um, um, what do they call that? Through that difficult, for, through, through that trial, okay. A lot of people go to Titan before they, before they die. A lot of people go mm -hmm. Titan. Mm -hmm. A lot of people that had indestructible faith, mm -hmm. quit practicing. For some reason, yeah, so weird. Before it's time to, yeah, okay. Which is your last breath? That's I know. and you're not, you don't quit practicing. Then you just go into non-substantiality. So it's so bad. It's it's a, yeah, but again, that's the whole point. It becomes more difficult because it's so much more valuable. You have to pay a higher price to obtain it. Okay? It's a jewel. Okay? So, of course, it's going to be something that's not simple. But it's not something that's out of your, the, the realm of your, your access. It's not impossible. No. Mm. Okay? So... The number of particles or dirt that uh, can be placed or balanced on a fingernail, uh, an expression used in Buddhist texts to express extreme scarcity or rarity. In particular, it symbolizes the rarity of being born a human being, mm -hmm. encountering the Buddhist teaching, and attaining Buddhahood. The phrase is often contrasted with expressions such as the specks of dirt in all the lands of the Ten Directions. The Nirvana Sutra says that those who do not believe in the correct teaching are as numerous as the specks of, the, of dirt in the lands of all the ten directions, while those who believe in the correct teaching are as few as the, few of the, as the specks of dirt that can be placed on a fingernail. By the way, this is interesting to know, specks of dust, as in that analogy, can also be translated as particles of dust, as in numberless nature world system, dust particles, kalpas, okay? Those are specks of dust, those particles of dust in numberless major world system particles. Okay, that's interesting. <coughs> okay, next, the three great secret laws. Now I just we just what are the three great secret what are the three great secret laws represented above that are necessary for you to attain Buddha? See if I can remember without reading them. Learning. Right? It's the first one. This is the very first thing that we, we, we just talked about. Pardon me, second. Learning, realization. Three types of learning. Uh, precepts, meditation, and wisdom. Precepts, meditation, and wisdom. Three great secret laws. Okay. The core principles of Nichiren's teachings. They are the object of devotion of the essential teaching, the Gohonzon, the Daimoku of the essential teaching, uh, Namyoho Rengekyo, and the sanctuary of the essential teaching wherever the Gohonzon is in, uh, enshrined. Here, essential teaching, as I've mentioned many times, refers to the teaching of Namyoho Rengekyo and not to the essential teaching or the latter 14 chapters of the Lotus Sutra. Nichiren established three essential principles to enable people in the latter day of the law to attain Buddhahood. Nichiren established these three essential principles to enable people in the latter day to attain Buddhahood through faith and yeah. chanting Daimoku. Mm. They are called secret because they are implicit in the text of the lifespan 16th chapter of the Lotus Sutra mm -hmm. and remained hidden or unknown until Nichiren revealed them. Mm -hmm. Okay? Uh, Nichiren regarded them as vital teaching. Pardon me. Regarded them as the vital teaching that Shakyamuni Buddha transferred to Bodhisattva superior practices in the supernatural 
powers, 21st chapter of the Lotus Sutra. He regarded his mission as one with that of Bodhisattva superior practices. So, the three great secret laws are essential. They are necessary. That means that you really cannot practice correctly without having an altar. Mm. Oh. Okay? Yeah. Understand that. Yeah. Mm. All right? Mm. You've got to have an altar. Mm. Mm. All right. So, uh, he regarded his mission as one with that of Bodhisattva uh, superior practices. And, and an altar can be anything. My altar when I started practicing was a cardboard Coke bot, uh, ca Coke can, 12 ounce Coke cans. Do you know how they used to come in 24 packs? That used to be the boots of Don of old back in the 70s. Uh -huh. You would take an empty one of those, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. perfect size for the regular size Gohansan. Okay, mm -hmm. you would take one of those cardboard car, uh, Coke bar cotton cartons, you would take aluminum foil, and you would wrap the whole thing in aluminum foil so it no, now lo no longer looked like cardboard, it looked shiny and pretty, right? Mm -hmm. You go ahead and put a thumbtack or a, a nail, depending on what you, what you had available mm -hmm. to you, right into the wall, that was gonna hold the boots on up, and <laughs> hold the Coke carton up, and also be what you would you know, hang the Gohans on from. Mm. And then you would get a juicy bead scarf, tape the top edge, right. and then you'd roll it up and roll it down. <laughs> Man, if you're poor, yeah. you still need, yeah. Yeah. that's an essential aspect. That's why I just told that story. Yeah. Don't think you need a great big box that's, mm. that's there because it's an expression of appreciation and benefit, mm. okay? Yeah. You know, you, you don't get a giant boots it on when you receive Gohonzon just for the sake of doing it. Mm -hmm. You usually have to be motivated that there's mm -hmm. going to be something worthwhile that occurs, okay? Right. So we, we change, side, you know, that's the whole point. Mm -hmm. it, it's not about whether mm -hmm. it's a treasure tower when, yeah. with the seven jewels on it, whether it's a cardboard Coke bottle, carton or it's the finest Akazawa Choyo. A handmade boots it on. Yeah. Okay? And I know that from personal experience because that sure worked for me, that car coat yes. carton. Yes. Okay. Um, let me, where am I? Okay. Until Nietzsche revealed them. Re Nietzsche re regarded them as vital teaching, that, as the vital teaching the Shaka community transferred to superior to Bodhisattva superior practices in the supernatural 21st chapter of the Sutra, he regarded his mission as one with Bodhisattva superior practices. The three great secret laws represent Nichiren's embodiment of the wonderful law of Namya Horengekyo, to which he was enlightened in the form in a, in a form that all people can practice and thereby gain access to that law within their own lives. Mm -hmm. He associated the three great secret laws with the three types of learning set forth in Buddhism, precepts, meditation, and wisdom. Specifically, the object of devotion corresponds to meditation, right? You can figure that out, right? Mm -hmm. The sanctuary to precepts. The, you gotta get a container, you gotta protect it, you gotta do the right things, mm -hmm. right? Pardon me, to, to the precepts, uh, uh, the sanctuary to precepts and daimoku to wisdom. Because it's wisdom that's making you chant daimoku to that correct object of devotion in that correct uh, uh, sanctuary. All right. Concerning the three types of learning based on the Lotus Sutra, Dingyo, in his questions and answers on regulations for students of the Tendai Lotus School, states, the space-like, movable, immovable precept, and the Daishon is gonna say this again in this chapter. The space-like, immovable precept, the space-like, immovable meditation, and the space-like, immovable wisdom. These three all together are transmitted under the name Wonderful Law. nam yoho Rengekyo. okay? Space-like, immovable. Okay, so he says, uh, uh, pardon me, our transmission, the three types of learning based on the Lotus Sutra are called space-like and immovable because they are eternal 
and indestructible. Nico, Nietzsche's successor, stated that in Nietzsche's teachings, the object of devotion uh, corresponds to the space-like immovable meditation, the sanctuary to the space-like immovable precept, and the daimoku to the space-like immovable wisdom. Nietzsche mentions the three great secret laws in several of his writings, all dated after his near execution at Tatsunakuchi and subsequent exile to Sato Island in 1271. And in a work known as on the three great secret laws, he offers a detailed definition. At the, th at the core of the three great secret laws is the object of devotion of the essential teaching, or Nietzsche's embodiment in the form of a mandala of the eternal law of nam myoho Rengekyo, which he fully realized and manifested in his life. Okay, so what is the Gohonzon? It, okay, this is hard for me because I have to talk in the way that I know this, mm -hmm. all right? And it isn't something that I picked up at the district meeting, okay? It's really stuff that Mr. Matsuoka taught me, Mr. Osaki taught me, and my own study has taught me, okay? Mm -hmm. So when I'm reading this, I'm really, you know, the object, okay, at the core of the three great secret laws is the object of the devotion of the essential teaching or Nietzsche's embodiment in the form of a mandala of the eternal law of nam myoho Rengekyo, which is in all of us, mm -hmm. which it was also in him, mm -hmm. which he fully realized, mm -hmm. okay, and manifested in his life mm -hmm. to, the, in, to the degree that he was one with it. He's able to manifest it in, in, in an object of devotion so that everybody else can be like him without having to be him. Right. Mm -hmm. All right? right? Because embracing this object of devotion called the Gohonzon is the only precept in Nietzsche's teaching, the place where it is enshrined corresponds to the place where one vows to observe the Buddhist precepts. Because when you're chanting Daimoku to that coat carton, it's, it's about, right? Yes. nam myoho renge -kyo. Yes. Uh, precepts. Uh, corresponds, pardon me. It corresponds to the place where one vows to observe the Buddhist precepts, the ordination platform or sanctuary mm -hmm. of the essential teaching. The term precept in Buddhism implies preventing uh, error and putting, to end, uh, putting an end to evil. The Daimoku of the essential teaching indicates the invocation or chanting of nam myoho renge -kyo with faith in the object of devotion. It includes chanting the Daimoku for oneself and teaching it to others. Thus, both the sanctuary and the Daimoku derive from the object of devotion. Okay? Why would that be? Because the dime, the object of the de, the, uh, the object of devotion is derived from the very life mm. of Nietzsche and Daishonin. When I talk about that being Nietzsche and Daishonin's embodied is Nietzsche. I mean, that's how I, Mr. Matsuoka explained that to me from the very beginning. That's why I never was confused. I could I could chant Daimoku to my coat carton with my Gohonzon in it, and I was speaking directly to Nietzsche and Daishonin. Yes. And I received a lot back, okay? So that's what this is really qualifying to you. It's not about some level of something that's ephemeral. It's about the level of what's eternal, mm -hmm. okay? Because embracing this object of devotion called the Gohonzon is the only precept in Nietzsche's teaching, the place where it is enshrined cor it corresponds to the place where one vows to observe the Buddhist precepts, the ordination platform or sanctuary of the essential teaching. The term precept in Buddhism implies preventing error and putting an end to evil. The Daimoku of the essential teaching indicates the invocation of, or chanting of nam myoho renge -kyo with faith in the object of devotion. It includes the chanting of the Daimoku for oneself and teaching it to others. 
Thus, both the sanctuary and the daimoku arrive from the object of devotion because it's from it's Nichiren's life. Mm. Together, the three great secret laws give one the access to become identical to Nichiren Daishonin. Mm. That's the whole point. Mm. That's the whole point. Master and disciple are one. They're the same thing. He qualifies that and then enables us to embrace him as the original teacher of the correct teaching of Mapo. Mm. Okay? Mm. I hope that wasn't too out there. Sanctuary of the essential teaching. In Nichiren's teachings, the place for enshrining the object of devotion of the essential teaching, the Gohonzon, that Nichiren inscribed and chanted the Daimoku of Namyo, that, and chanting the Daimoku of Namyoho Rengekyo, one of the three great secret laws. So the sanctuary of the uh, essential teaching is not only uh, uh, it, uh, the Gohonzon, but, but that's what you're going to chant to, right? One of the three great secret laws, the other two being the object devo of devotion of the essential teaching and the daimoku of, or invocation of the essential teaching. We're still talking, we're talking about the Coke carton right now. Nichiren associated th these three with the three types of learning in Buddhism, precepts, meditation, and wisdom, among which the sanctuary corresponds to precepts. The purpose of keeping Buddhist precepts is to prevent error and put an end to evil within oneself okay so we established the uh, uh 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 altar for the sake of not slandering the reality of what the gohonzon is we protect it we honor it we pay homage to it right we do sancho to it right all those kinds of things okay among the sanctuary corresponds to precepts those are all precepts the purpose of keeping Buddhist precepts is to prevent error and put an end to evil within oneself. Doing that will help you transform toward the 10th world. Hmm. Sanctuary in this context originally meant an ordination platform like Dengyo did, where one vowed to observe the monastic precepts. In Nichiren's teachings, however, there are no precepts other than to believe in the object of devotion and chant the Daimoku Namyo uh, Horengekyo. Namyo and chant the Daimoku Namyo Horengekyo. Therefore, the place where one enshrines the object of devotion and chants Namyo Horengekyo is the sanctuary. The sanctuary of the essential teaching is called the space like immovable precept indicating the certainty and expansiveness of the benefit derived from embracing the object of devotion and chanting nam myoho to the in the, to the gohonzon in the sanctuary in other words it can be a coke carton it can be a big akazawa choyo right next gohonzon uh, this is rather long uh, and I knew that today's session may be nothing more than going over in dictionary stuff. And I've read this to you once, but it's a long time ago. Mm -hmm. And we say Gohonzon, and we look at the Gohonzon, and we chant to the Gohonzon. And I know we all feel what we know what the Gohonzon is mm -hmm. in our life. But what, what is the Gohonzon specifically as it relates to the Daishonin's teaching? Okay, so I'm going to read that to you. Mm -hmm. Gohonzon, the object of devotion, the word go is an honorific pre, uh, prefix, and honzon means object of respect or devotion. In Nichiren's teaching, the object of devotion has two aspects. The object in t of devotion in terms of the law, and the object of devotion in terms of the person. That's what I was just explaining a moment ago, mm. okay? These may be described as follows. The object of devotion in terms of the law. Nichiren's man mandala that embodied the eternal intrinsic law of Namyoho Rengekyo. That law is the source of all Buddhas and the seed of Buddhahood for all people. In other words, Nichiren identified Namyoho Rengekyo as the ultimate law permeating life and the universe and embodied it in the form of a mandala. In his questions and answers on the object of devotion, Nietzsche refers to the object of devotion for the 
people of, in the latter day of the law as the title, the daimoku of the Lotus Sutra. He further describes the title as the essence of the Lotus Sutra or nam myoho rengekyo. The actual essence is nam myoho rengekyo. He further describes the title, oh, pardon me, or, or nam myoho rengekyo to be found only in the depths of the lifespan chapter because he's talking about nam myoho rengekyo, right? Mm. Uh, that's not on the surface of the uh, Lotus Sutra. The object of devotion for observing the mind, one of his goshos reads, Myoho Rengekyo appears in the center of the treasure tower with the Buddha, uh, with the Buddha uh, Shakyamuni many treasures seated to the right and left and flanking them the four Bodhisattvas followed by Shakyamuni led by superior practices, Manjushri, Maitreya, and the other Bodhisattvas who are Followers of the four bodhisattvas are seated below. In this passage, Nietzsche clarifies the relationship between the law of Nam Myoho Rengekyo, the, uh, the Buddha Shakyamuni, and many treasures, and the various bodhisattvas depicted on the Gohonzon. In this way, he emphasizes Nam Myoho Rengekyo as the fundamental object of devotion. Nam Myoho Rengekyo Nietzsche is what's in the center, mm. right? Those Buddhas are just smaller characters at the top, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. Okay. <clears throat> uh, pardon me. In this way, he emphasizes Nam Yoho Rengekyo as a fundamental object of devotion. The real aspect of the Gohonzon explains that all living beings of the ten worlds display the dignified attributes that they inherently possess through the benefit of Nam Yoho Rengekyo. The object of devotion in terms of the law is explained in greater detail in Nietzsche's writings such as the object of devotion for observing the mind and the real aspect of the Gohonzon. Two, the object of devotion in terms of the person. In his reply to Kyo'o, now and again, Nietzsche and Shoshu and us and two other schools that are split off from Nietzsche and Shoshu are the only ones that believe, that perceive the Daishonin in this fashion. The object of devotion in terms of the person, because this is all come from, from Nietzsche Khan. In his reply to Kyo O, the 26th high priest of Nietzsche and Shoshu, the object of devotion in terms of the person, in his reply to Kyo O, Nietzsche and write, Nietzsche and writes, I, Nietzsche, have inscribed my life in Sumi ink. So believe in the Gohonsan with your whole heart. The Buddha's will is, not, is the Lotus Sutra. But the soul of Nichiren is nothing other than nam myoho rengekyo. Nichiren here expresses his realization that nam myoho rengekyo is the origin and basis of his life, uh, which he embodied in Sumi Inc. in the form of the mandala he calls Gohonzon. Uh, the record of the orally transmitted teaching says the object of devotion is thus the entire entity, uh, pardon me, this is what I, why I just said what I already said. Somewhere in here you're going to get, I think it's when we get to the 16th chapter, I don't know, this is, I don't, only because, because we're re reading this do I realize how much of my understanding and perception of everything is really based on this. The record of the orally transmitted teaching says the object of devotion is thus the entity of the entire body of the votary of the Lotus Sutra. The votary here refers to Nichiren, the original Buddha, mm -hmm. the original teacher, mm -hmm. okay, who is just like us, yes. but, got the, but got the Buddhahood before anybody else. Right. It also says the Buddha of the latter day of the law is an ordinary person and an ordinary priest. An ordinary priest here is also refers to Nichiren because Nichiren revealed and spread Nam Myoho Rengekyo, which is manifest as the he, which is manifest as the person in the law. He is regarded by his disciple and successor Nico and his followers as the Buddha of the latter day of the law. We all perceive it that way, right? Mm. Nietzsche, and and I speak specifically in regard to this. Nichiren refers himself, pardon me, Nichiren himself writes in the opening of the eyes on the 12th day of the ninth month of last year between the hours of the rat and the ox, 
this person named Nietzsche was beheaded. It is his soul that has come to this island of Sado. And in the second month of the following year, Snowbound is writing this to send to his close disciples. He states that he was beheaded, though actually he survived the execution of Tatsunakuchi, implying that the ordinary person, Nietzsche, ceased to exist. In this context, the passage, it is, soul, it is his soul that has come to this island of Sado, his place of exile, means that Nietzsche described himself as having revealed a deeper, true identity in the course of his attempted execution. He realized he's the Buddha. And Nico and his followers equate that identity with the Buddha of the latter day of the law. What he experienced, we also experienced, is called Hoshaku Kimpon. The oneness of the person and the law. This means, and if, 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 if the law is one with that I shown, and the law is also one with us, understand mm -hmm. that. Yes, yes. Mm -hmm. There's no significance of Nietzsche that doesn't also pertain to us. Mm -hmm. He almost manifested just to make sure we all know it's just regular people. Mm -hmm. Yes. Mm -hmm. Okay? I'm a regular people, so my, this whole teaching is based on regular people. Okay? There are no gods here. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. The oneness of the person, okay. Uh, the, pardon me. The oneness of the person of the law. This means that the object of devotion in terms of the person, the object in, of devotion in terms of the law, are one in their essence, are one in their essence, in the nam yoho renge of them, yes. okay? The law is inseparable from the person and vice versa. The object of devotion in terms of the law is the physical embodiment as a mandala, the gohonzon, of the eternal and intrinsic law of nam yoho renge -kyo. Nietzsche, that only Nietzsche could create. Nietzsche writes in his re create, not duplicate. Re Nietzsche writes in his reply to Kyo'o, I, Nietzsche, have inscribed my life in Sumi ink, so believe in the Gohonzon with your whole heart. This passage indicates that Nietzsche embodied in the Gohonzon the state, the state of life he enjoyed as the eternal body, Buddha, who personified the law. If he personified the law, then he also, his life and our lives are one. Mm -hmm. When I keep saying the Gohanzan and Nam Yoho Rengeko and Nietzsche and Daishonin and your, fun, uh, your true identity are the same thing, this is what I'm talking about. Mm -hmm. Let me say it again. Nietzsche writes in his reply to Kyo'o, I, Nietzsche, have inscribed my life in Sumi ink, so believe in the Gohonzon with your whole heart. This passage indicates that Nietzsche embodied in the Gohonzon the state of life he enjoyed as the eternal Buddha who personified the law. Are we eternal? Yes. Okay. The original state is Nam Yoho Ren Geiko, and everything else is a manifestation of that. Okay. We are also eternal. Yes. We don't have to be Nietzsche and Buddhists to be eternal. That's the whole point. Our suffering as common mortals can last eternally if we don't change it. Right. All right? That's called hell in some ways of view. Yeah. Okay? Yes. All right. Uh, who, okay. That Nietzsche embodied the Gohonza in the state of life he enjoyed as the eternal Buddha who personified the law so that people could attain the same state of enlightenment. Not a lesser one, not one dependent upon him, the same, independent, the same from, the, from ourselves manifest this state of Buddhahood. The record of the orally transmitted teachings reads, the body that is freely received and used, also the Buddha of limitless joy. Now, when our life is devoted to the law, when it's devoted to Kosen Rufu, when it's prop, devoted to Kosen Rufu, uh, the, the propagation of the, of, of the teaching that brings about Kosen Rufu, what are we? We are that Buddha, the Buddha that is the body that is freely received and used because we came here to be able to get a body, to be able to manifest our reward body, okay? To be able to express our Dharma body, okay? The Buddha, this Buddha has forsaken august appearances. So we look like common people rather than 
you know, gods yeah. or 16 feet tall or whatever the, the, the sutra says you, they look like, okay? Whew. Go, go get into tantric Buddhism if you want to see some weird looking Buddhas. All right, the, the, this Buddha has first forsaken august appearances. The Buddha who has forsaken august appearances is the Buddha eternally endowed with the three bodies. What is the Daishonin constantly telling us? I am a body of, the, I am a Buddha of the original, uh, the, the, the original uh, state. Yeah. A Buddha of the, th of the uh, originally with, uh, endowed with the three bodies. That's what we're talking about here. Okay, again, he's saying that a body that is freely received and used also the body of limitless joy is none other than the principle of 3,000 realms in a single moment of life. It's none other than Buddhahood. Yes. The great teacher Tentai says a single moment of life comprising the 3,000 realm is, life, is itself the body that is freely received and used. This Buddha has forsaken august uh, appearances. The Buddha that has forsaken august appearances is the B Buddha eternally endowed with the three bodies. That's all living beings. Mm -hmm. Now Nichiren and his followers who chant nam myoho renge are just this, says Nichiren. The Buddha who has forsaken august appearances means a Buddha who is no different from an ordinary person in form and appearance. Mm -hmm. Okay, We are all yeah. that Buddha that has forsaken august appearances. Four. The core of the three great secret laws. Don't forget, we're still just talking about what is the Gohonza. Yes. Yes. As we, and then now we're describing ourselves. Yes. All right? Yep. That's still the Gohonza. Uh, okay, four. The core of the three great secret laws. The Gohonza, or the object of devotion of the essential teaching, is the core of the three great secret laws in Nietzsche's doctrine that represent the purpose of his life. That's why I said the, the Gohonza, or pardon me, the, the, the sanctuary and the uh, invocation both come from the object of devotion, okay? That's what this is talking about. The Gohonza, the core of the three great secret laws. The Gohonza, or the object of the devotion of the essential teaching, is the core of the three great secret laws in Nietzsche's do doctrine that uh, represent the purpose of his life. The three great secret laws are the object of devotion of the essential teaching, the invocation or daimoku of the essential teaching, and the sanctuary of the essential teaching. Here, essential teaching refers to the teaching of nam myoho renge -kyo, not to the essential teaching latter half of the Lotus Sutra. Nichiren expressed the law of nam myoho renge -kyo. He realized within his own life in, the, in three forms, which correspond to three, the three types of learning in Buddhism, precepts, meditation, and wisdom. The object of devotion, which he created, his life corresponds to meditation. The object of uh, the invocation, nam myoho renge comes from his enlightenment. It's hidden in the depths of the 16th chapter, right? You don't find nam myoho renge you know, uh, Chinese characters uh, pronounced in Japanese anywhere, right? Mm. Right. The object of devotion course, corresponds to meditation, the invocation to wisdom, and the sanctuary to precepts. Sanctuary is a translation of the Japanese word kaidan, which is also translated as ordination platform. This is a platform where practitioners vow to uphold the Buddhist precepts. Isn't that what we do in front of the Gohonzon? Yeah. Yes. In Nichiren's teaching, to embrace the object of devotion is the only precept. Is that not what we do? Yes. yes. And the only place where one enshrines the object of devotion in Chan Daimoku is called the sanctuary. Again, to keep faith in the object of devotion and chant the Daimoku while teaching others to chant it is called the invocation. Both the sanctuary and the invocation derive from the object of devotion. Both the sanctuary and the inv invocation derive, they come from the object of, the, of devotion, the Gohonzon. Here, object of devotion is the core of all three. Okay, mm -hmm. that's five. Now we're, this is the fifth one. This is all about the characters. The inscriptions on the Gohonzon. In the center of the Gohonzon are written in the Chinese characters, Nam Yoho Renge Kyo Nichiren. 
On either side are the characters for the names of beings representing each of the ten worlds. At the top of the Gohons and the names of Shakyamuni, Buddha, and many treasures appear respectively to the immediate left and right when facing the Gohons of, uh, of these central characters. They res represent the realm of or the realm or world of Buddhahood. The four bodhisattvas, superior practices, boundless practices, pure practices, and firmly established practices who lead the other bodhisattvas of the earth are positioned to the left and right of the two Buddhas. Those are the six small symbols you see at the very top. Uh, Shakyamuni, mini, uh, Shakyamuni, Sha, uh, pardon me, Nichiren, uh, pardon me, uh, Shakyamuni and many treasures, pardon me, Shakyamuni, many treasures, and then uh, 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 the four great bodhisattvas. Okay, and then they, along with other bodhisattvas in the second row, pardon me, yeah, if, the four bodhisattvas, superior practice, balanced practices, pure practices, and firmly established practices, which lead the other bodhisattvas of the earth are positioned to the left and right of the two Buddhas at the top line. They, along with the other bodhisattvas in the second row, form uh, the the uh, from the top, front, the second row from the top, such as Universal Worthy and Manjushri, represent the realm of bodhisattvas. And also in the second row are persons of the two vehicles, voice hearers and cause awakened ones, such as Sheri Putra and Maheke Shayapa. And flanking them are representatives of the realm of the heavenly beings, such as Brahme, Chakra, and the devil king of the sixth heaven, and the gods of the sun and the moon. In the third row appear a, a wheel-turning king, representing the realm of the human beings, an Asura king, representing the realm of Asuras, a dragon king, representing the realm of animals, mother, uh, the mother of the uh, demon children, and the tim demon daughters, representing the realm of hungry spirits, and Devadatta, representing the realm of hell. Moreover, the four heavenly kings are positioned in the four corners of the Gohonzon, again, when facing the Gohonzon. Vaishravana in the upper left, upholder in the nation in the upper right, wide-eyed in the lower left, an increase in growth in the lower uh, left, while all other figures on the Gohonzon are represented in Chinese characters, the names of the wisdom king craving filled and the wisdom king immovable are written in Vashravana and holder of the nation, respectively, and in Siddham, uh, medieval uh, Sanskrit uh, script. That's why they don't look like Chinese characters, the two things that are in the middle on the sides. Here, the wisdom king craving field represents the principle that earthly desires are enlightenment, and the wisdom king immovable on the right, the principle are that the sufferings of birth and death are nirvana. The characters on the Gohonzon include the names of Bodhisattva, great Bodhisattva Hachiman and the Sun Goddess. You, you know where those are. All these names express the principles of the Ten Worlds exist within the eternal Buddha's life and that living beings of the Ten Worlds can attain Buddhahood. Not all of the above names appear on every Gohonzon, but what, whichever ones do uh, uh, represent all of the Ten Worlds. The names of the great teacher Tentai, the great teacher Dengyo, <laughs> Sorry, I thought my glasses are inscribed in the lower part of the Gohonzon, representing those who transmitted the true lineage of Buddhism. These are uh, there are two inscriptions gleaned from Yellow's annotations in the words and phrases of the Lotus Sutra, which Nichiren used to inscribe the power of the Gohonzon and the law in it embodies. One placed in the upper right facing the Gohan and reads. Those who vex or trouble the practitioners of the law will have their heads split in seven pieces. The other in the upper left reads, those who give alms to them will enjoy good fortune surpassing the 10 honorable titles. The 10 honorable titles are epithets applied to the Buddha expressing his virtue, wisdom, and compassion. In the lower right is Nichiren's declaration that in the lower right, this is the great mandala never known, uh, never before known in the entire land of Jampavipa in the more than 2,230 years since the Buddha's passing. Daimoku of the essential teaching. The invocation of Namyoho Rengekyo, more precisely the practice of chanting Namyoho Rengekyo with belief in the object of devotion of the essential teaching. 
Here, essential teaching refers to the teaching of Nam Myoho Rengekyo, not the essential teaching defined as the latter half of Lotus Sutra. The Daimoku of the essential teaching is one of the three great secret laws set forth by Nichiren. There are two aspects of Daimoku, the Daimoku of faith and the Daimoku of practice. In his letter to Horan, Nichiren writes, if you try to practice the teachings of the Lotus Sutra without faith, it would be like trying to enter a jeweled mountain without hands to pick up its treasures. Thus, the Daimoku of the essential teaching requires both faith and practice. See also three great secret laws. It also requires the correct object of devotion. It just said so, the invocation. More precisely, the practice of chanting Nam Myoho Rengekyo with belief in the object of devotion. So you gotta have belief in the object of devotion. Pardon me. Uh, <clears throat> here we go. Threefold world. The world of unenlightened beings who transmigrate within the six paths from hell through the realm of heavenly beings. The threefold world consists of, in ascending world, the world of desire, the world of form, the world of formlessness. Can you attain Buddhahood in the world of form or the world of formlessness? No. The world of desire is the only place. The Sahe world is the only place you can attain Buddhahood. The world of desire comprises the four paths, the realms of hell, hungry spirits, animals, and asuras. The four continents surrounding Mount Sumeru that contain the realm of human beings, the first of the six divisions of heaven, the lowest up part of the realm of heavenly beings. The beings in this world are ruled by various cravings such as those for food, drink, and sex. Now, is there anything wrong with any of those cravings? No. Why? They are the predication of your existence. Without the craving to food, if you don't eat, you'll starve. If you don't, without the craving to drink, you'll de dehydrate. Without the craving to have sex, you'll go extinct. Yeah. Okay? So you can apply whatever moral you want to. These are the necessities of actual existence. Yeah. Food, drink, sex. All right? I love this Buddhism. It makes so much sense. Yeah. <laughs> really? Yes, um, yes. Uh, do, 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 I don't know. Okay. Uh, okay, food, drink, and sex. That's why I, 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 that's why I embraced it. There were no rules. There was nothing that I couldn't go along with. They weren't asking anything of me that I couldn't go along with. They just said, have faith and chant Daimoku. Mm, yes. That's it. I don't have to quit smoking. I don't have to quit drinking. You're not going to ask me who I'm going out with or whether she's married. You're not, nothing, none of that shit. <laughs> no, none of it. Wow. Wonderful. <laughs> wow. And it really works? Wow. Okay, two, the world of form consists of the four meditation heavens, which are, which again, you can't attain Buddha in the world of form. It's supposed to be a, a move up from the world of desire, but we just qualify. The world of desire is really what's required for existence to appear. Okay. Two, the world of form consists of the four meditation heavens, which are, which are further divided into 18 heavens, 16 or 17, according to other explanations. The beings here are free from desires, <clears throat> cravings, appetites, but still have physical form and are thus a subject to certain material restrictions. What good is it then? <laughs> you can't eat, you can't drink, and you can't have sex. I don't want to go. I don't want, I, I, I'm going to stay down here. <laughs> the world of formlessness comprises the, form, uh, the, uh, the, the highest of the, three, the, the threefold world. The world of formlessness comprises the four realms of boundless empty space, boundless consciousness, nothingness, mm -hmm. and neither thought nor no thought. That's blown out Hinayana bullshit. Mm -hmm. All right? That's empty. That, that's Hinayana. No, that, that's not real. Mm -hmm. Okay. The world of formlessness, okay, so if you worked your way up to this point that I shown it says, you just fall all the way back to the world of desire and start all over. <sighs> okay, so again, and neither thought nor nor thought. Here beings are free from desires and are from, uh, and from physical form with its material restrictions. Also, the lifetimes of these uh, entities uh, in the world of formlessness are of such long duration you wouldn't want to be stuck in that form for that long a duration. 
What I'm saying is that it's, it sounds like it's not a good time, but the world of desire is a good place. It's a good place. It's not a bad place. It's a confusingly good place. Prajne or wisdom. The wisdom that perceives the true nature of all things. Because prajne leads to enlightenment, we're still talking about the precepts, uh, the three precepts, uh, uh, precepts, meditation, and wisdom, right? This is the wisdom. This is the definition of that wisdom. Prajne, the wisdom that perceives the true nature of all things. What would that be then? The true nature, that they're non-substantial. They're in a temporary state, temporary state of, of, of existence. It understands the middle way, all right? The wisdom that perceives the true nature of all things is not non-substantial. It's the, the wisdom of the middle way because prajne leads to enlightenment. It is regarded as the mother or source of all Buddhas and obtaining prajne as the goal of Buddhist practice. Buddhism set forth three types of learning that practitioners should aim to master the observance of precepts, the observance of meditation, and the, and the cultivation of prajne. The wisdom of prajne sutras in particular emphasize the cultivation of prajne or the w perfection of wisdom. Also says also three, three types of learning. Three types of learning. Hang on. Oh, three types of learning. We already, we already, we did it. We already did it. Okay, now I'm at meditation. That's where, I, that's why I'm reading these. We already did the three types of learning. Meditation. Uh, the practice of focusing the mind on one point in order to purify the spirit, eradicate illusions, and perceive the truth. Meditation was practiced widely in India before Shakyamuni and was later incorporated into Buddhism, which mm -hmm. developed its own forms and approaches. In Mahayana Buddhism, Dhyana uh, means meditation is the fifth of the six paramitas, paramitas, six practices required of Mahayana Bodhisattvas. In China, Tentai established a system of meditative practice he named Concentration Insight. China also saw the appearance of Cha'an or Zen school, which places primary emphasis on, man on meditation as a practice for attaining enlightenment. See also seated meditation, da 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 going on. Precepts. Precepts, meditation, and wisdom. Rules of discipline. One of the three types of learning that, dis that Buddhists should master. The word precept in Buddhism has the connotation of preventing error and putting an end to evil. Broadly speaking, Buddhist precepts can be divided in into those of Hinayana and those of Mahayana. That's what I was talking about before. The Hinayana precepts consist of several categories or groupings, such as the five precepts, eight precepts, 10 precepts, 250 precepts, and 500 precepts. Don't forget there were 500 for women and 250 for men. The most fundamental of these are the five precepts, not to kill, not to steal, not to engage in sexual misconduct, not to lie, not to drink uh, intoxicant, intoxicants. One who observes these precepts is said to be reborn as a Christian. No, I mean, as a human being. <laughs> the eight precepts can uh, comprise these five precepts, the third of which is replaced by not to engage in any sexual relations, not to, to be celibate, plus three others. Not to wear six, number, uh, to, not to wear ornaments or perfume, nor to listen to singing or watch dancing. That sounds like uh, uh, the... Uh, what school of Christianity is that? The uh, church. Ah. I don't want to get into it. It doesn't matter. There's a, there's a school of Christianity exactly like that. No, you can't wear ornaments, can't wear perfume. You don't listen to singing. You don't dance. No. Uh, the Mormons. Mormons. Oh, Mormons. Oh, yeah. uh, not to, uh, seven, not to sleep on an elevated or broad bed. And eight, not to eat an improper, at an improper hour, uh, i.e. afternoon. The eight precepts are for lay believers and are, for, and are observed only on specified days. The ten precepts are for both male and female novices of the Buddhist order. They consist of the eight precepts described above, plus two orders. Number nine, not to listen to singing 
or watch dancing, which is part of above, but has made an independent precept and 10, not to own valuable such as gold and silver. 250 precepts and the 500 precepts are the complete rules of discipline for fully ordained monks and nuns respectively. Mahayana precepts include the three comprehensive precepts, the 10 major precepts and the 40, uh, okay. I'm gonna to skip to the bottom. There's, I, I'm, not, I'm gonna go into the Mahayana precepts. You might as know, well know what they are because this was all about Dingyo. Mahayana precepts, in, before Nam Yaho Rengekyo, you had to do all this. Mahayana precepts include the three constant comprehensive precepts, the 10 major precepts, the 48 minor precepts. The three comprehensive precepts are for Mahayana bodhisattvas, whether laity or, or clergy. So you have a devotion. They are the precept that encompasses all the rules and standards of behavior set forth by the Buddha for Mahayana bodhisattvas to observe all these, those precepts and prevent evil too the precept to, that encompasses all good deeds, i.e. to strive to perform good deeds, and three, the, con, the precept that encompasses all living beings to instruct and benefit all living beings. The third is also called the precept for benefiting sentient beings. The 10 major precepts are for clergy. They are not to steal, not, uh, not to kill, not to steal, not to engage in any sexual relations, not to lie, not to sell liquor, not to speak, of past misdeeds or other Buddhists, uh, not to praise oneself or disparage others, not to begrudge offerings or spare one's efforts uh, for the sake of Buddhism, not to give way to anger, and not to speak ill of the three treasures of Buddhism. The 48 minor precepts are set forth in the Brahmanets uh, Sutra and deal with matters of less importance than those covered by the 10 major ones. Okay, so you can see there are plenty of schools of Buddhism that adopt the same kinds of issues of don't do this, live this way. It's a formulaic circumstances of rules and regulations. It's not something that actually manifests from within and a, a transformation occurs. You're actually following a list of rules. You're in compliance. You're not in a form of, of evolution. Do you understand what I'm saying? In other words, all of these precepts are rules that you're supposed to follow. They were given to you by whom? Supposedly Shakyamuni, but you didn't get them from Shakyamuni. No. You got them from whatever Hinayana priest yes. was laying this on you. Yeah. Okay, mm -hmm. that's what I'm talking about. You can find uh, there are stricter and less strict kinds of Islam, stricter and less strict strict kinds of Christianity, uh, different, uh, uh, you know, there are different um, ordained classes of Catholicism. Mm. You know, they, they, they come by different names, but they're based on, they're essentially Catholicism with a few changes, and then suddenly they're called Methodists or something like that. Right. Okay, those are all, again, it's, it's very common in life yes. that these same values be reflected as universal truths. Yes. Okay. In China, priests of the Chintai and other Mahayana schools received the Hinayana precepts in their ordination, though they interpreted these in light of Mahayana doctrine. In Japan, however, Dengyo, the founder of the Chintai school, pointed out the contradiction of the Mahayana priests having to receive the Hinayana ordination uh, platform and based on the Lotus Sutra adopted the three co uh, comprehensive concepts, the 10 major precepts, and the 48 minor precepts as the specific rules of Mahayana discipline that priests were to uphold. So this would have all been stuff that the Daishonin was taught as an acolyte and as a young priest, because he's from a Tendai school. That was, that was Dingyo, okay? Because these precepts were based on Lotus Sutra, which is known as Tentai's doctrine, as in Tentai's doctrine as the perfect teaching, they are called the perfect precepts. So what I'm trying to say is that when the Daishonin rewrote the rules, what he's telling us here and saying, now it's this, when it was that. Right. He's the one telling us to blow off this stuff now because it's no longer the right age, that it's no longer applicable. It's not you taking it upon yourself to do that, okay? Um, so those are the four noble truths. That goes all the way back to Hinayana, the four virtues, the four noble qualities of a Buddha's life, eternity, happiness, true self, and purity. These are the flips that President Kate is always talking about. 
the four noble, the four uh, true eternity, happiness, true self, and purity. I'd never heard of them until President Kato started talking to them all the time about you turning. Uh, 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 it's going to tell me here. Uh, these describe the true nature of a Buddha's life, which is pure and eternal, which in, uh, and which manifests the true self in, uh, and enjoys absolute happiness. Because ordinary people possess the Buddha nature, they too can develop the four virtues when they attain, attain Buddhahood by fulfilling the Buddha's teachings. Four vi virtues of a, and those are a wheel turning king, doesn't matter. He, we're going to read about the supplement to the three major works on the Lotus Sutra. You've never heard of that before. I just want to let you know that's from a, a, a priest named Tsung uh, from the Tentai school in China. Uh, on the, and he was doing it was based on uh, the three major works from Tentai, as well as Melo's commentaries on them. Okay. And Melo's Chinese, right? So it was Tentai and Miolo was a commentary on, because Miolo had done, you know, on words and phrases, on profound meaning. Okay, same, time, same book title. Six difficult, nine easy acts. I don't have to get into it. Uh, you guys, three kinds of wisdom. I'm not going to get into it. Uh, I'll save these last three for another day. Last two, All right. actually. All right. And there's no reason to read next week's beginning until next week all right we'll stop there okay. i hope some of that was a refresher it will help you understand what we're about to read in chapter 11. All right. it'll make going through chapter 11 much easier for me because i I'll already know you already know mm -hmm. whether you remember it or not i'll remind you you know okay okay, okay. okay. Thank, you. thank you very much thank you